so much for the kind intro. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for bearing with us. Hope it pleases well. So, um, well, see today, uh, we'll have a presentation for building a gigabyte platform for a target workflow. Brought to you by Will, it's me, and JD. Hey. So, just a brief intro. I'm Will Wayne, software engineer from Bloomberg. I work on the workflow runtime team. Basically, basically we offer uh, workflow orchestration as a service. We help our fellow engineers uh, orchestrate their workflows and uh, pipelines. So I'm today with uh, JP. Thank you so much, Will. Um, yep, I'm JP Zivilich. I'm the CTO and founder of Pipekit. We are a control plane for Argo workflows. Um, I'm currently based in Paris, France, where in my free time, I love to butcher the French language. All right. Cool. Thank you, Will. Yeah, so when we set out to build PipeKit, um, it was kind of roughly the like 2017, 2018 era, um, and we spoke to a bunch of data scientists and engineers about their problems, and they all mentioned like, hey, we were running into problems with dependency management and scaling. And the obvious solution to us was like, well, why not just use Docker and Kubernetes? That's like what those things do. Um, and they said that the tooling wasn't there, um, the dev experience wasn't mature enough, and so we got to work on trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. We then found Argo Workflows as being the uh, workflow orchestrator that seemed to be winning in the cloud native like workflow orchestrator wars, and said like, all right, let's dive in a little bit there. That led us to find that many people were building out these workflow orchestration platforms or these data science platforms internally and spending a lot of uh, resources doing it. So we said, hey, why not uh, like use our expertise and start building that out as a service? So there's a set of common requirements that both of our platforms had. Um, obviously, we all wanted to use like Kubernetes for our compute layer. Um, both teams agreed that Argo Workflows uh, was the orchestrator of choice that we wanted to go with because it's built um, using like Kubernetes native primitives. You're interacting with like pods and all the same things that you'd be interacting with, like if you're just like writing, you know, any sort of like application definition. Um, we also needed to both schedule jobs across multiple clusters from a single control plane. 
uh, for Bloomberg's team, having like a consistent REST API was super important. And for us on Pipekit, in addition to a REST API, um, our customers were asking for like tight integrations with their Git providers, such as GitLab, GitHub, uh, and also a CLI uh, that ran on top of um, what they were already using for Argo workflows. Uh, going along with that, uh, our customers needed strong role-based access control so they could say what users have access to what resources on what cluster, which expands like an extra dimension um, than what you can currently get if you're running like a single cluster setup with Argo workflows. Um, and then one other thing that was kind of interesting is we both wanted to set up some sort of uh, workflow template versioning. Um, within like a vanilla Argo workflow setup, you have access to workflow templates, which is how you like reuse code, um, but you only get like one version. And so we wanted something similar to what we do with like Docker images where you get like, hey, I've got like my ID service or whatever, and I've got like a, you know, however million like tags that are associated with that. We wanted to replicate that for like easy rollbacks um, with Argo workflows templates. Great, so we have some Pipekit specific requirements and approaches uh, that we needed to tackle when we were setting out to build our platform. So they can be filtered into like three broad areas. The first was ease of use, the second was security, and then there's some just kind of like additional, I don't know, let's call them like junk drawer features, like you know that like drawer in your house where you're like, eh, I don't know where I'm gonna fit like all the other stuff. We'll put them in that category. So when it came to uh, you know just like using the platform, uh, again, our customers had like three things that they wanted. One was like a CLI where they could schedule workflows on different clusters from that single spot. Essentially something that would be like a drop-in replacement for the Argo workflow CLI, which performs wonderfully for like a single cluster setup. 
Uh, second, they wanted uh, like an HTTP API. Uh, so if they you know, were using like some sort of like webhook or something like that, they could integrate into that nicely, specify like a workflow definition, specify like the cluster name and send it that way. And then lastly, something um, that we get asked about all the time are these like Git provider connections. Uh, so connections with like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket, things that are going to be, you know, like a dedicated GitHub app or a GitLab app, whatever the Bitbucket equivalent is, uh, so that we can read those like webhook events, uh, like pull down the, the code that might be like hosted, uh, you know, run things and then update whatever the like checks are on each respective platform uh, with a good, you know, like check if like the workflow uh, succeeded and acts if it failed, so on and so forth. Um, and that just does a lot generally to like make the dev experience um, like much smoother and easier to use. From the security standpoint, um, initially when we set out to build the product, we were thinking like, hey, people want like, you know, a hosted version of the platform, right, right? Well, that turned out to be wrong. Uh, like people wanted to bring their own clusters, especially if you're running like data processing. Um, you know, you don't want to trust that to like a, a, a third party. You want to say like, hey, I have X number of Kubernetes clusters under management. Uh, I want to bring these clusters. And additionally, I want to make it so that these don't have to be exposed to the public internet. So we were a little limited in um, like say setting up like endpoints on each cluster. Uh, we had to figure out what is like some sort of like pull based or like uh, what we went with was like a queuing based uh, system so that, you know, we could easily um, say like, hey, you know, we're gonna limit like the security footprint here. And then lastly, like uh, similarly was like bringing uh, your own logging provider. So again, initially when we set out, we thought like, hey, people will trust us with their logs. That turned out not to be the case. People wanna bring their own uh, like logging backends and that's uh, something that we support as well. And then circling back in on the uh, workflow template uh, setup, uh, whereas Bloomberg and company was able to go with that Kyberno based solution, you know, using like a, uh, very opinionated setup and a mutating webhook. That isn't something that scales for like multiple uh, like companies that are using like the single platform. We have to be uh, like very flexible in what sort of like workflow template names and tags that we allow. Uh, whereas like Bloomberg was very intent on like, hey, we need to limit you strictly to that semantic versioning. Like we as a vendor can't be opinionated on what like an end co company like wants to do. So what we did instead was say like, we're gonna rely on the Git provider uh, to give that back end uh, there and say like, those are where the workflow templates are stored. And then the Git uh, tags, whenever like a user cuts a Git tag for that repo or that uh, like workflow template file, that'll serve as like the tag, which uh, the uh, work Argo workflows like runtime will then have access to. Hopefully it'll make sense when we get to the diagrams. Anyway.
Thank you so much, Will. So our architecture follows like somewhat similar patterns, but there are some restrictions that we uh, run into since, again, we're not just serving like one company, but several companies. Um, so we'll break it out in terms of layer. Uh, so the top layer is how our customers are interacting uh, with the control plane. Again, I mentioned that CLI, HTTP API, and then the Git provider uh, like backends. Uh, next, each one of those is gonna send what is essentially like an HTTP request to our hosted control plane. Now, uh, with Bloomberg's approach, you saw that they use uh, like Postgres as a source of truth for state across their multiple clusters, and we use uh, what is our hosted control plane, which is essentially just a Postgres database, but with API layers on top of it, right? Like, if you're uh, connecting like multiple different people to like, you know, a similar database or the same database, you need to have good primitives for authentication uh, and things of that sort. So it wouldn't be safe uh, to just say like, hey, we're gonna open up like a, a Postgres database and um, you know, let everyone like directly connect to it. So the Pipekit control plan serves as like a like central API layer for storing state uh, for all of our different customers. Now, next we've got this message queue layer. I'm gonna briefly jump into that and get into what like the individual clusters look like. So whenever a, a customer like registers their cluster, they have Argo workflows installed on that cluster, but they also have the Pipekit agent. And that does a lot of the things that you saw Will cover uh, previously, such as like garbage collection and things like that. But it also reads, in our case, from these uh, like message queues that get spun up uh, one per cluster. Or I think now we've done it uh, with like multiple message queues per, per cluster. Right now we're using SQS as our mes uh, message queue provider of choice, uh, but we're thinking about moving to Redis to have some other like nice primitives such as like canceling in-flight messages and things of that source, sort. So each cluster then um, you know, is reading these message queues and saying, or listening to uh, events that are emitted by the Pipekit control plane. And once we get uh, that event that comes in, that uh, tells us like, hey, we need to schedule like an Argo workflow on like this namespace and on this cluster, um, or actually, never mind, it's um, in this namespace, right? Since each message queue is dedicated per cluster. So if a cluster says like, hey, you know, this is the, uh, the message comes through, it knows I'm gonna schedule uh, like this workflow on this cluster. And throughout the life cycle of that, it's sending HTTP requests back to our like hosted control plane to update the, the state of what the workflow is doing. And so that each one of our users can have insights into what's happening across their entire fleet of clusters. All right. Now, let's uh, bring it back to some like contrasts and comparisons between our two solutions. So the first problem that we both tackled was like multi our multi-cluster scheduling across different sets of uh, clusters. And at Pipekit, we also went with an agent-based uh, approach, the difference be being that we are relying a bit more heavily on message queues, uh, given that we don't have as much uh, like direct API control and control over the infrastructure that Bloomberg does. Uh, we're also providing that uh, like ho hosted control plane with, a, you know, again, a dedicated API layer, providing that source of truth instead of um, the direct access to the Postgres database.
And at PipeKit, um, as much as I would love to force everyone to use Semver because I think it's you know awesome, we just can't be as opinionated as uh, like the Bloomberg platform team uh, can. So we set things up again um, to just read workflow templates from Git tags, and that gives people the flexibility to you know make like tag whatever and just kind of send it. Um, which, again, you know I, I would like to be a little bit more opinionated on that one, but that's not always realistic uh, for everyone's needs. All right, let's get into a demo. So I'm gonna go ahead and show uh, importing a cluster in the PipeKit UI. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and create this cluster uh, within the PipeKit organization. And we've already got one cluster running, but I'm gonna show you how to install uh, like PipeKit on my Docker desktop. Cool. So we went ahead and created this like cluster uh, manifest. I'm gonna go within our terminal here and uh, apply the YAML that we generated. This is going to uh, spin up our PipeKit agent. Um, currently, we already have like a functioning Argo workflows instance running that you can see here, right? We've got the server and the workflow uh, controller. And we've got a 30 second uh, you know, readiness check just to make sure that uh, everything's uh, working. Looks like we created our message queue successfully. And in seven seconds, this guy should be live. Yeah, all right, it's gonna be live. Cool. Yep, it's live now. All right, so now that this is live, we can demonstrate how to uh, submit workflows to multiple clusters. We uh, have a cluster that's hosted remotely uh, that's called like a runner uh, cluster. And so first I'll show you like what uh, YAML we're gonna send to it. This is just some like dummy test YAML. You can find this in like the open source Argo workflows. Uh, set up, it's gonna log you know, a, a whale to the console. Um, so first we're gonna submit this to our like uh, remote cluster and we can see that we've spun up a new workflow. It is currently running. We're gonna get the logs of that workflow uh, available to us. Uh, and then we can see on our local like Docker desktop that nothing's there since right we submitted it to that remote cluster. But next, um, you know, when we submit another workflow, we should, uh, in this case, be able to see like, hey, this workflow is running on Docker desktop. So we went ahead and submitted it, or not yet. I'm going ahead and submitting it here. And we're specifying JP Docker desktop, right? That's our new cluster. Um, and boom, I'm gonna refresh the page here and we've got another DAG that's been declared. Here we can see like, this is the state of the workflow that's being run on the second cluster, that Docker desktop that we just imported. And so we have the logs coming in live and we can see like the global state of the workflow. And if we go to our like uh, Kubernetes visualizer, we can see on our Docker desktop that again, this workflow is running, the pods are getting spun up and we have access to information about these pods, right? Uh, so we can see on the first uh, cluster, the workflow has been completed. And if I go back to the Docker desktop cluster, we are completed as well. I think yeah, that should be it. All right. And thank you. I think, do we have time for q and I'm seeing the, the 10 minutes in the back. Are we gonna? We, yeah, we're, we probably have time for like one quick question. So get your hands up fast and then we'll do it. You gotta make this question Okay, yeah, we'll count, go guys. over there. Um, yeah, I love the approach, by the way. That's really cool to see like, um, you know, how like a company implements it as well as a vendor, like alongside and the, the, con the compare and contrast, right? I don't think I've ever seen a talk like that. It was awesome. My man. Um, Great presentation. Do you plan to integrate it with Algo events? Uh, like integrate with Argo events? Was that the question? Yeah. Um, yeah. As a vendor, I don't know, right? That's something that, um, you know, we got to like just pull our customers, figure out like how tight of an integration they want or if they want the integration and, you know, go from there. Um, how about y'all at Bloomberg? Okay. Thank you. All good. Great. Um, all right. I'm not going to keep everyone because I think it's time for a break now. Um, but obviously, you know, go and refresh yourselves and then come back. We have three fantastic talks lined up afterwards. Um, so, yeah, thank you again. Let's have a round of applause for um, Will and JP.